welcome to this week's topic, uh, looking at audiences and media power. I'm Dr. Craig Norris, and I'll be taking you through this adventure into audiences and media power, picking up where we ended last week, looking at semiotics. So I'll disappear quickly and narrate, hopefully, some interesting PowerPoint slides. So this image might be one that is familiar to some. On the uh, left-hand side, we have a normal map of New Zealand. And on the right-hand side, we have a map of New Zealand that's not normal. As you'll see, it features the New Zealand Middle Earth map. Uh, so what I'm showing here from, as you would have seen last week, is this idea of semiotics. This idea that these signs on the left are very typical images of New Zealand. And my argument in today's lecture is that the image on the right is New Zealand as understood through media. This is New Zealand via the media of the film franchise Lord of the Rings that has been incredibly popular. Of course, both of these spaces are New Zealand. One of them just happens to be through media. And when I say New Zealand as Lord of the Rings, what I'm really thinking of is this idea of film-induced tourism, you know, tourism that is induced by movie making. In this case, New Zealand and Lord of the Rings. And here we have an image of a guy, a tour guide, we can imagine, holding a um, ring binder with an image from the movie. Uh, um, where the hobbit is kind of on the on the trail and he's pointing out you know here we are in real life on this on this location which was in lord of the rings so it's this moment of the reality of the media meeting the reality of the real world and within that we can ask some really interesting questions about how media's power defines the world around us All right so here we have another image again this one's interesting to me because he's actually holding media. So here he is holding a laptop, trying to convey to the audience this scene from Lord of the Rings. Uh, you have the tree in the background, and as the caption says, uh, tour guide led us to the exact sites where scenes were filmed and played relevant portions of the film on his laptop for comparison. So the idea being that you have media reality, Lord of the Rings on one hand and the real world on the other hand. But what's interesting here is where they come together. This middle space where we have this, this kind of um, in-between reality, right? The reality of the Lord of the Rings fans, the reality of what the rules are for Lord of the Rings, and the reality of actually being in New Zealand, the weather, how you're feeling, what you're wearing, right? So there are all these realities that are going around. What does this mean? Well, this picks up on last week's discussion where we looked at Stuart Hall's concept of encoding, decoding, right? So this image is of, you know, literally someone like person A saying something, right? Encoding, creating a meaning or message, and that is being heard by person B who decodes it, right? So here we're looking at this idea of, if we go back to the Lord of the Rings, the idea that we have a movie that is encoded, Right, so the movie producers, Peter Jackson, created Lord of the Rings. Here it's being decoded in terms of actual locations in New Zealand. Right, so we're having this idea of, of an idea of reality and media. So why does this matter? Right, why, why should we um, be interested in this idea? Well, in today's chat, what I want to do is look at this idea that media can shape our perception of the world around us, that media is incredibly powerful in actually defining how we see the world around us. It has an immense impact on our ability to, for instance, Andy Ruddock in his book in 2018 points out, media can shape how we act in public and private places, right? We can literally, we can literally show an example of that if you think about ever being on a bus and if someone brings out their mobile phone, that can trigger all of this idea of the etiquette of using media in a pr 
pu public space, right? Your phone if they're talking too loud, um, the rules around using media, right? In public spaces is also very important as well as private. And the readings that we had this week uh, kind of reflect that idea, you know, so um, the experience of people going to a prison for the first time were drawing upon their assumptions of watching movies and television shows set in prisons to try and orient themselves around that space. So media can very much shape how we work and relax, right? If we're feeling stressed, we might decide to watch Netflix, right? So we're using media as a way to relax. If we're busy at work on the bus, again, we might decide we need to, to read material for this week's class, right? Where we're using, we're incorporating media into that, that space, right? So we're, we're using media, our mobile phones, obviously, quite often to continue some work. Uh, it's also involved in how we organize our time, what it's like. And, and, yeah, and I think this last one's a really interesting point, what it's like to live within the rules of a particular time, place, or institution. Right? So in many ways, if we think about uh, the development of social media and social media kind of becoming and uh, uh, more significant or not over time, um, we can track that into a specific story of what it's like to live here and now. That we're watching, for instance, an event via Twitter, right? And that event might look very different through Twitter than it would look on the um, evening news, right? So the idea being that as we're engaging with media, we're also engaging with what it means to be here at this point in time, what it means to be in the particular place we're in and the institution we're part of. And we can see this with examples like this one, where the idea that media is influencing the way we understand rules. So I'm sure people have seen examples like this before. Here's one titled, A Film Critic and Scientist Review Pandemic Films in the Era of Coronavirus. And this article goes through in some depth, basically, as it says, a film critic and scientists talking about each film, right? So here we have 12 monkeys, but they go through contagion, all of them. Talking about what are the rules that this fictional world sets up for pandemics, right? What are the conventions there? And many of them have become profoundly influential in terms of how we would cope and see a setting as well. Uh, and then the scientist, of course, debunking it and saying, you know, it's, it's, it has problems and so forth. So, again, the popularity of these type of articles or on YouTube, again, you know, Stunt Reactor Reacts or um, Doctor Reacts to Films shows the popularity of um, looking at experts as they talk about how media shapes the reality around us and where it gets it wrong and where it gets it right. We can also see this idea of the impact of media on the life around us. In some of the work we did this week, so for those that were part of the tutorial, we worked through images like this, right? For those that don't know, of course, this is the proposed new logo for Australia, right? Moving from the kangaroo that we see on the right to the image of the waddle, right? And again, the idea being that there was a backlash against that image, that it wasn't particularly useful, that it didn't help understand Australia, that it didn't kind of convey the reality of what Australia was uh, through the waddle as well as through uh, as well as a kangaroo does. Um, interestingly, we can also see this with shows like Flora's Lava, where a number of articles have picked up the idea is why, why are there all these conspiracy signs in the Flora's Lava TV show? So it's a Netflix show, it's just an adventure type show, a kind of challenge game show. But why are there all these conspiracy images there, right? Aliens in sarcophaguses from Egypt, Inca uh, large heads, the flat earth image, it's not a globe, it's a flat earth. And again, speculating on what type of reality is being um, encouraged by this. Is Flora's Lava, for instance, a, a conspiracy theory idea, right? That it's kind of subtly reinforcing conspiracy theory ideas. Um, we can see the idea of um, this, also the power of image here with, with images such as 
uh, the Black Lives Matters movements, um, questions around what these images mean and so forth. All right, so again, looking through all these images that we've covered over the last week, we can see how interesting these images are. Um, and yeah, please do send, uh, as we're doing the live lecture, if there's anything you'd like to chat or refer to, please do post some, something in the chat. Uh, it'd be wonderful to get some engagement there. So again, these, all, these images are just about particular realities which are created and their impact. So media can provide compelling stories that we use to make sense of what's happening around us. It provides us with ideas that we use in daily life, and it can guide our expectations and beliefs. So we looked at that through two readings. There was Van den Bok's and Van der Bosch's piece on when the viewer goes to prison, learning fact from watching fiction, as well as Gibson's piece on, <laughs> I won't do the onomatopoeia, but Skippy the Bush Kangaroo and Question of Australian Seriousness. And both those articles are really useful in terms of looking at this question of how media shapes our understanding of the world around us. So I want to start firstly with these images. So you may know that um, um, these images are from TV shows. Uh, and please do, yeah, look, it's, it's, I'm just noticing the chat. So um, um, look, we're doing a bit of field work here. So the chat's open, so I'm happy for anyone to chat. And part of this, of course, it's a media subject. So in the middle of the pandemic and the global COVID-19 space, this is a fun way to try to get this, this media unit into an actual public space. So what I want to talk through at the moment is this idea of, of these images, right? So some of you might know them. Um, we have on one hand the series Oz, as well as the series Prison Breaks. We're, we're very familiar with this genre. Uh, the idea of, of prisons. Now, what's interesting is the article that we read through was really talking about that, that nervous step that, in the case of uh, the, the research was done in Belgium, uh, these were Belgium prisoners who were negotiating their first experience of prison. And this research was done by interviewing a series of prisoners as they were reflecting on their first few months being in prison for the first time. And the research pulled out all these really fascinating stories about how, even though this was in Belgium, many of the first time inmates drew heavily upon American prison dramas for what they assumed they were about to experience. And again, what we're showing here is the impact of media, the impact that a television show, which we know is fictional, but its popularity is really defined by its realism, right? So the showrunners in interviews would often talk about how they'd bring in various uh, prison advisors. And so they were really going for a, a kind of replication of that reality. And therefore, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that for many people, when they go to prison for the first time, they'll draw upon television, right? So we maybe shouldn't be surprised that even in Belgium, much like maybe here in Australia, we would defer to this idea of, of prison dramas. And what's interesting about that space, of course, is some of the, some of the uh, kind of misunderstandings that it triggered, right? Moments where prisoners were talking about, uh, as we discussed in the readings, we were talking about moments where the prison guard, for instance, would ask, you know, would you like a television, right? And the, the new inmate thinking, oh, this prison guard has got to be joking, right? He's got to be really making me feel embarrassed because I can't get a television. I'm a prisoner, right? I've seen all the shit TV shows. So again, these moments of confusion, he got a television and he was very perplexed. Obviously, the television image was very different from the real experience. And I noticed there's a really good comment here about Chomsky's ideas of manufactured consent. Spot on. In many ways, the theory that we're looking at through this is what's referred to as cultivation analysis. This is George Gerbner's idea of the cultivation theory. And that's one where, you know, it, it, it's not that media directly defines and affects us in a hypodermic syringe model. That is simply by seeing a message, we're not going to automatically believe it. But over time and over an accumulation of images, we will start to cultivate. That is, we'll slowly start to be inculcated or assume and defer to these representations. So this prison drama 
research project was a great example of that, showing how you know, the many, many years of watching tele, uh, prison TV dramas for these new inmates actually defined what they assumed their social experience in prison would be and led to a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of frustration for those prisoners when they realized the television version was very different from the real version. Also, the American justice system and prison system is entirely different from the Belgian prison system, which also raises some really good question. You know, Chomsky refers to manufacturing consent about the power of U.S. entertainment in particular, that the U.S. hegemony or the power of Hollywood and so forth can mean often uh, we, we getting an insight into an American system that has nothing to do with other global nations. So we can really see here one of the powers of media is to mediate social relationships. It mediates the relationship we have with others. It can provide an anchor in the social world. And finally, it can show how media are scenery for many real social stages. Right? So again, if we go back here, we can see that for the new prison inmates, they were using their television dramas to talk about their experience of being in prison for the first time. So, you know, if you've not been overseas somewhere or you're looking to break the ice with someone, you might use media to talk about, uh, um, our, you know, to build a relationship with someone. Uh, also, it can provide an anchor in the social world, which is really interesting. If you're going to prison for the first time, you don't know anyone you can talk to, you might anchor your, your, your assumptions in media. That is, you'll be drawing upon fictional television dramas, maybe in this case, or documentaries, or what you've seen on the news, to anchor your social experience that you're about to have. Right? And also, when you talk to people about experiences they have in life, often media will be sprinkled throughout the conversation, right? So media can be scenery for real social life and experience. So for a prisoner, if you're talking to them, or for anyone, for any conversation, you might find it fascinating all of a sudden that that media, television texts, the portrayal of prisons in the television comes up as a really interesting and engaging part of the discussion. So as I said, this is the theory of cultivation analysis, um, which is... Uh, established by George Gerbner back in 1998. And basically, cultivation analysis began from research looking at, in particular, crime dramas um, and looking at how their familiarity to the audience really influenced what viewers expected would happen to them when they met real law enforcement officers. Uh, so Gerbner's research on cultivation analysis was specifically trying to pull apart, you know, what is the role of media in certain settings? And in particular, if you know, a general citizen is going to meet a, a law enforcement officer, how important is, is media within that for that first experience? And also within that, how, how responsible, what's the responsibility media has to make sure they um, um, you know, kind of calibrate their meaning truthfully there? So here we have a, a great image. I think, which speaks to the reading that we had in terms of media expectations of new prisoners. So this is a, just a, an image of a type of prison cell. Uh, and of course, we could imagine going into a, a cell like this and, and being very confused if, if we had our expectations from television or TV dramas like Oz. So Vandenbroek and Vanderbosch studied this phenomenon in detail, looking at, at novice convicts, you know, people going to jail for the first time. And this study just asked a small group of people how media influence works when encountering a new situation that they've uh, seen modeled on, on TV dramas many, many times. So what's interesting about this question, I think, though, is that for all of us, we don't need to be prisoners to really have this experience. For example, I think um, if we've ever been a tourist going to a really famous place, We've all felt that, or we've all been asked that question, you know, does the real experience live up to the media-based experience? You know, does the real experience of going to the Eiffel Tower live up to all the movies and television we've seen where the Eiffel Tower is there, and it might be connected with romance and so forth? So I think we've all had, we can all impart this moment of, um, you know, reality versus expectation, and that expectation defined through media. Uh, what's interesting from an Australian perspective that the second reading shows us is 
Our own history in Australia linked to this. So here we have an image of Skippy, the bush kangaroo. Um, uh, what's intriguing here, of course, is Skippy is, is way back from the 1970s. And what I liked about the article, research article that Gibson wrote was how he linked his everyday experiences growing up in the 1970s to the structures of the media industry in Australia at that time, that it was just starting to globalize, right? And Skippy came across, came along at a perfect time. So Skippy, for those that may not have seen it, and I'm sorry, for some reason I've forgotten this cover doesn't feature Skippy the bush kangaroo in it. But anyway, it tells the story of uh, um, a kind of outback area in Australia where Skippy the bush kangaroo is involved in all manner of hijinks and helping solve crimes and so forth. And he's assisted by his um, human friends, the young boy there and the, the park ranger, and they get up to all manner of danger. Anyway, what was interesting about Skippy the bush kangaroo is that it became Australia's first major global television hit. Right? It was a significant um, moment in television history in Australia. And his own childhood memories kind of got wrapped up in this moment of, of kind of the recognition of Australia's media impact. And so what I think is interesting here is that, you know, for anyone doing research on media, what's important is trying to link in everyday experiences with these bigger questions of, you know, media industry structure and media history. And in this case, in the reading here, Gibson was talking about his experiences growing up in Australia during the 1970s and the connection between, you know, watching Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, the leisure of that moment in Australia's history and and that that moment where australia generally became a global exporter so as you'd see at the top this is a dvd from the czech republic so skippy the bush kangaroo truly became a a genuinely global phenomena and again for many people much like years later in the next decade crocodile dundee defined australia skippy the bush kangaroo also defined what australia would be for many international visitors in the 80s as they came to Australia, imagining us all having kangaroos in our backyard and, I don't know, riding kangaroos to work and so forth. Anyway, those those assumptions of what Australia was were really grounded through very, very popular global exports like Skippy in the 1970s. So applying this concept of how media shapes our understanding of the world around us uh, can be taken again, quite easily. We don't need to think about more dramatic experiences of going to prison <laughs> to try to reconcile it. As I'm saying, we can think about it in terms of our tourism. And this is a kind of, you know, almost bittersweet discussion because of COVID-19 and the difficulty of traveling today. But it is fun to think about how many movies have shaped our idea of the world around us and inspired desires of us to, to travel to these locations. So this is a map of the world according to 007, as the caption says, 50 years of globe-trotting adventure, but for James Bond, the world is not enough. So here we have a map of the world with various movies highlighted in their geographies of location. Um, and there's been a number of research papers written on James Bond tourism, people that travel the world looking for James Bond locations and taking photos of themselves with it. And again, why is there that desire to make these trips to experience James Bond's world? And again, the idea being that the media has very much defined the world around us. And for these James Bond tourists, it's not only defined the world, it's also provided them a rationale for traveling the world. So what I want to do now is have a fun little discussion of a, of a research project I did myself, talking about this issue of how we can experience a media reality which is linked to a media text which has very little to do with the real world, but offers a really fun story to rethink the real world. So um, here we are uh, doing this unit in the University of Tasmania, and here's a map of Australia on the left, and right down the bottom in green is Tasmania. And then there's a kind of uh, map to the right, which is the map of Tasmania. Between Launceston and Hobart is the city of Ross. So it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it doesn't really have much of a media link in terms of 
you know, there's not really been any big films set there. And its main claim to fame is having a very old convict built bridge. It's a very nice city. It's often a drop off point between traveling from Launceston to Hobart, the two major cities. But what's interesting, much like the New Zealand map I showed you of Lord of the Rings, here in this Japanese newspaper, so this is the Nichigo Press, which is the Australian-based newspaper for Japanese people. So it's a, it's a newspaper in Australia for local Japanese living in Australia. Anyway, what we have here is on the left-hand side a column of a map of Tasmania with much like the New Zealand map beforehand, typical tourist images. There's a dairy connections, there's a lot of nature. Anyway, more interestingly, on the right column is a question written in Japanese. You know, are you a Ghibli fan? Are you interested in Ghibli locations? So Studio Ghibli, for those that don't know, is kind of the equivalent of Disney, I guess. It's a major Japanese animation uh, production company. And there's many, many rumors that allegedly a number of locations in Tasmania were the inspiration for very well-known Japanese anime by Studio Ghibli. So here we have a map saying you can experience media Tasmania. That is, you can experience Ghibli Tasmania. Uh, the reality of, of Tasmania is defined through media in this case. So I want to, I was really curious about this, so I wanted to go a little bit more in depth. So this is one of the locations which allegedly is connected to Japanese media in Tasmania. So this is the story of the Japanese anime known as Kiki's Delivery Service and the local bakery in Ross. There's two bakeries. This is this is one of them. Uh, so here we have some images at the top of the real Ross Bakery. All right. So as you can see, it, it has um, all manner of sweets and bread and it has a old wood uh, fired oven, right? So very authentic and it does have colonial history linked to it. So it is this very old heritage listed uh, bakery, right? And what's interesting below is an image from the Japanese animation movie Kiki's Delivery Service, right? Which happens to also have a kind of similar bakery setting. And the main character for those that have not seen it basically tells the coming of age story of a young witch called Kiki who has to travel to another location, right? She has to leave her home village and become a new village witch somewhere foreign. And it's all about her drama as she struggles to be accepted and understand this new foreign land. And you might be able to detect where I'm going with this story, right? So here we have a story of, of a foreigner, a fish out of water, coming of age, young person, you know, testing their metal overseas and struggling to overcome these challenges and where the Ross Bakery might suddenly fit into this. So what I found really interesting was, um, oh, before I get to this layer, actually, what I found really interesting was how popular this story is, right? So talking to the bakery owners, they told me that, you know, Every day they'll have five or ten tourists coming in who want to get a photo of the bakery and say they're huge Kiki fan, uh, Kiki's Delivery Service fans. And it's an incredibly popular media text uh, for particular fans. Right? So what was interesting was the bakery wanted to know, well, is this actually the case? Was the bakery actually used by Studio Ghibli? Did Japanese animators come down to Tasmania and use the bakery for inspiration. Because it does seem kind of similar to the bakery that's in the film, right? There's an attic upstairs, there's a there's a wood fire, there's a there's there's aspects of it which are kind of similar. And fortunately on the blog, so this is the Studio Ghibli blog, and up the top we have the original Japanese quote. Uh, unfortunately Studio Ghibli had to say that um, they, they do use, of course, real places around the world as references, but there are no places in Australia that Ghibli have used. So it's very funny and strange that this rumor has spread. So you'd think that's the end of the story, right? You know, the Studio Ghibli never came to Tasmania. 
they've not actually used the bakery and yeah while some people may think the bakery was based on it it's sadly not the case you'd think that's the end but it really isn't what's fascinating is that this story continues despite the fact jubilee have said they've never been to tasmania and why is that right why is there such a strong interest to use fictional media to understand the world around us Right. So I looked at the visitor log of people who stayed overnight at the bakery in Kiki's room. So they have a room upstairs, much like in the film, and many visiting Japanese tourists, but also tourists throughout Asia, come there to stay in Kiki's room to kind of experience it. So I started to go through all the visitor log entries and try to research why, why are people so keen to understand the reality of Ross and Australia through a fictional Japanese animation set in this idealistic European 1920s setting. And here we have an example of someone drawing very beautifully the main character in the visitor log and then writing uh, their pleasure of staying there, right? So very much transferring the Kiki space into the real Ross space, so they say, Sometimes I feel a little down, but I like this town by Kiki. We love Ross, Tasmania, Australia. We're also glad that we're the first, so back in 2007. So very much these, they very much transported into this space. They very much enjoy it. And what was interesting was trying to explore this question of media reality. So how Kiki's delivery service animation really established what Tasmania is. So what the fan experience of Tasmania was, much like I asked about expectations versus reality, what does a Ghibli fan expect Tasmania will offer? And what is the reality of that? Because obviously it's far away from a Ghibli encounter, or is it? Or is there, is there actually a lot of, of Miyazaki or Ghibli in Tasmania? While they may not have come to Tasmania, is it actually a useful fictional text to appreciate parts of Tasmania through still? And what are the conflicts they encounter between this fiction and reality? So again, it's a really interesting question to ask about how media shapes the world around us, how it can define our motivations to go to places, so people going to Tasmania specifically to experience it. And there's tons of examples like this, right? So um, Breaking Bad, for those that have watched it, will know the memorable scene of the pizza being thrown up on top of the roof. And of course, it's gotten to such a problem of people going to this location to perform pizza throwing on the roof acts to take photos of that the Breaking Bad creator has had to plead with visitors to stop throwing pizza at the Water White House. All right, so again, a few years back, it did lead to, because of course, it's a real house that is really lived in. And part of this, of course, is really fascinating because you have, again, these clashes of rules. What happens when we understand the world around us through media? Here's a fun way of seeing what happens. Well, the rules of being a Breaking Bad fan might say, well, I'm a fan, so I'm going to get my Instagram photo and perform the pizza throwing on the roof scene. Right? So that's, that's a rule of cosplay, a rule of fandom. You'd think it's fine. But we all know that in... The real world or, or where that's a problem of course is that if people live there the last thing you want to have is pizzas being thrown on your roof and strangers coming in taking photos the rules of private property the rules of respect the rules of everything else non-breaking bad and non-breaking bad fandom make this a very bad act so again we can see these clashes of rules right media perception rules or media fan rules and then the rules of, of, let's call it the real world, the rules of, 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 other, of other spaces and institutions. Also, you know, more fun, of course, we get these, these kind of reenactment shots, right? So these fun little, you know, you go to the location, you know the setting, and so you restage it. And as we saw before, the Lord of the Rings shot, so a lot of reenactment going on where basically you're, you're showing the media reality and blurring it into this, this real world setting. So here we have Studio Ghibli, of course, many films. And what I want to quickly talk about is, is where this story's led us to. So um, while Ghibli never went there, 
it did cause a number of Japanese television shows to come to Tasmania to do little travel episodes of visiting Tasmania. And here's one of them, Ishi-chan's Animal Kingdom Joking Trip, traveling 1,000 kilometers to the southern paradise of Tasmania. It's a literal translation of the Japanese television show name. So Ishi-chan is a well-known celebrity in Japan, and he did a kind of travel show going around Tasmania. And of course, when he went to Ross, what does he do but cosplay as characters from Kiki's Delivery Service? That is Gigi the Cat, played by Ishi-chan, and his co-host playing Kiki. So again, even though Ghibli never endorsed having set the bakery in Tasmania, other media kind of jump on top of that story and kind of create a reality to it. Television shows are now featuring the bakery in Ross as linked to Kiki and defining it as a media experience. So again, we can see the power of media in defining this location. And as I talked about before, it can be a way in which social media defines the relevance of going to locations. So this is the Japanese, it's a little old now, it's, it's a Japanese social media site called Mixi, uh, which has sim- since been kind of replaced by various other social media spaces. But what's interesting to me about this, you know, Mixi, which is similar to Facebook, right? It has many groups that are set up where they talk about and post on specific topics. Here we have one talking about Ghibli locations in Australia, right? So this is a social media group based in Japan who are posting up information on where to go to in Australia to find Studio Ghibli anime locations, right? Even though, you know, not only have Studio Ghibli never been to Tasmania, there's no evidence yet I've uncovered that they've been to any location in Australia, but that hasn't prevented many people to basically have a completely different map of Australia, you know, from everything from Perth in Western Australia to, you know, Brisbane in Queensland, which remaps national monuments, wonders of nature, into Ghibli references. Not only Ghibli references, but inspirations for specific scenes. Uh, here's the one for the Ross Bakery. So again, it's it's showing how a certain media interest can suddenly dominate the reality of Ghibli, right? And we could say within this, there might be entry points into a deeper knowledge of Tasmania, right? A good way of approaching this might be Agreeing with Gerbner's cultivation analysis, yeah, if you're a huge Ghibli fan, you've probably cultivated a kind of skewed perspective of the world around us through Ghibli. But on the other hand, it may have been the inspiration to go into locations through which you may develop deeper understanding of the genuine experiences of being there, possibly. Uh, what's interesting also is the commodification of this new reality. So here's an ad for um, a tour guide, right? So are you a huge Ghibli fan? Are you coming to Australia? Do you want to go to the anime locations? Uh, contact me, and for a small fee, I'll show you these locations, right? So again, there's there's a kind of parasitical um, commodification that occurs here uh, around that reality. And Bringing me back to that first image that I showed, as you can see, what's interesting here for me is that whereas the Lord of the Rings story is very open, that is, it's very well established, New Zealand use it in their brand nationalism advertising, the link between Ghibli and Tasmania is very tenuous and, of course, not uh, strictly true. So it makes it more of a closed experience. Also, what's interesting to me about the... Studio Ghibli Tasmania connection is that it's coming predominantly from a non-English language speaking audience, which means there's already a cultural and language barrier there for understanding what that audience is getting out of Ghibli Australia. So for me, it's a much more closed experience and does show that sometimes these representations of the world around us can be maybe echo chambers if you wanted to be critical of them. Um, which doesn't really permeate or kind of fluctuate between uh, like local Tasmanians. I'm not sure how many local Tasmanians would know about 
the connection between Kiki and Japan or the Ross Bakery in Japan. Maybe maybe some do. It'll be interesting to, to explore that question a bit further. So look, uh, that's the kind of journey I'd like to start provoking in discussion like this. And just to conclude with uh, thought, where I think this matters overall is specifically in terms of, you know, if you're interested in media's impact of the world around us, what I'd encourage people to do is just really listen to everyday encounters with media. I think there's incredibly rich sources of, of experiences of data just by listening to very banal everyday experiences um, from which, you know, you can really see some interesting things about how media affect the world around us. So starting with a conversation about Japanese cartoons or an American prison drama can suddenly have very influent, interesting stories about, wow, did you know there's meant to be a location in Tasmania based on that? Or, you know, <laughs> the real prison is nothing like the American prison. So these stories aren't just anecdotes. You know, I think there are accounts of what it's like to live in a particular time, right? So even tracing out this story of how the Ross Bakery got caught up in Kiki's delivery service gets us talking about various Japanese social media locations like Mixi. It gets us talking about heritage versus fiction. Um, so I do think that, yeah, asking some really interesting questions about how media texts influence our understanding of the world around us can integrate across a whole set of, of stories about private and public life. Um, and what I find most fascinating about this, of course, is how disparate the situations are, how suddenly a very straightforward question about, you know, did the did your trip overseas match the media representation of it overseas can really take us into some fascinating discussions of real social change or real social experiences. So we'll wrap it up there. I hope you found it very interesting. And I look forward to bringing in more of the type of research I've been doing around media's impact on how we understand the world around us in coming weeks. And if we can, we'll see if we can stream a couple of more on Twitch to see what that might generate. Look forward to seeing everyone later on in the unit. Thanks again for your listening pleasure.